good to see all of you here tonight. We're going to start with an opening prayer, and the prayer is actually Psalm 34, verses 2 to 10. And if you've got your phone and you want to look it up on the phone to say it along with me, make sure that you look for the Catholic Bible, which is USCC, um, is that the one to get? Okay. So I'll let you look that up. What was, what was it? Psalm 34, verses 2 to 10. I sought the Lord, and he answered me, delivered me from all my fears. Look to him and be radiant, and your faces may not blush for shame. This poor one cried out, and the Lord heard, and from all his distress he saved him. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he saves them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the sober one who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his holy ones. Nothing is lacking to those who fear him. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's been a week since I taught the class on Holy Week and the Triduum, and talking about where we had been on Passion Sunday and where we were going to be going in the next few days. And now we're still celebrating Easter. We don't just celebrate one day. We celebrate for a while. We've got the octave eight days of Easter. So this is still Easter that we celebrate. We're going to spend a little bit of time this evening before we have our class on stewardship to kind of reflect on what happened on Holy Saturday. So I want just you to kind of cast your mind back to where we were Saturday morning. We had just finished, of course, Holy Thursday, the celebration of the institution of the Eucharist, the celebration of the institution of the priesthood, the celebration of the mercy of the Lord. We venerated the cross on Good Friday and remembered Jesus' crucifixion. And here it is, Holy Saturday. The tabernacle is empty. We actually met, of course, downstairs, but if you looked in the church when we came in to the main body of the church, the tabernacle doors were still wide open. And we began downstairs in Bishop's Hall, and we began in prayer, contemplating the silence of the day as we gathered. We were centering our hearts on God's message in Isaiah that we should not be afraid, that he has called each of us by name, that we belong to him. We were reflecting on what we saw as we walked the stations of the cross, looking at each of those images. We didn't get to look at all of them, but we looked at a number of them. What do we see? How does this speak to me? What does this say about what Jesus is going through? And then we went back down to Bishop's Hall and we listened to Jesus' assurance that he will search for us as a shepherd searches for a lost sheep, even when he has 99 that are saved and only one is gone. He will go after the one that is gone. Or the way a woman would search for a lost and finally, we were considering the words from that ancient homily to rise and go forth for the banquet is ready and the kingdom of God of heaven has been prepared for us, prepared from all eternity. And 
then the Easter Vigil. We gathered in the darkened church, waiting there in the dark until Father asked us to rise and face the back of the church. And while we could not see what was going on, we heard Father's pronouncements as he inserted the grains of incense into the Easter candle and recalled the holy wounds of Christ. But what we could see then from our pews was that light, that light of Christ coming through the door, the Easter candle carried by the deacon. And we heard the deacon sing, the light of Christ. And we responded also in, in song, thanks be to God. The announcement was made two more times. And then the light began to spread. Father came to light our candles for those of us who've been baptized. We got to have hold of that candle and we watched the, the light begin to fill the church. We listened to the exalted, that song, the chant that the deacon did. And the words that, that are incorporated there that tell us about our salvation. And then we began to listen to the readings, the history of our faith. We listened to the readings about creation. We listened about Abraham's recognition and devotion to the one true God, willing to sacrifice his only son, Isaac, his demonstration of faith. We listened to the story from Exodus, the prefigurement of the redemptive power of baptism as God, through Moses' direction, uh, rolled back the Red Sea. We listened about the pity that the Lord, our Redeemer, took on us, took on his people, Israel. The promise that he made of an everlasting covenant. All you who are thirsty, come to the water. We listen to an invitation to walk by the light of wisdom to splendor and the promise of a new heart in place of a stony one. And then there was the Gloria. And with the Gloria, with the singing, all those bells, and then we had light. And the darkness was banished now entirely by the light. And we saw our worship <coughs> space had been transformed. Lighted candles were brought out. We had rich altar cloths. There were lilies and other flowers that lined the sanctuary that earlier had been bare. And we rejoiced in the epistle that assured us that Christ, raised from the dead, dies no more. We heard the gospel proclaimed, and we listened to a profound homily reassuring us that we are chosen that in this new day, we are called to rise and to begin again with Jesus at our side and the heavenly kingdom awaiting us. And we called on the saints above, Maximil Maximilian Colby, St. Paul, St. Michael, St. Justin Martyr, and St. Gemma Galgani to pray for us as we prepare for the baptism of the three young people. After the baptism, we relit our candles so that all in church could renew their own baptismal promises. Father Next invited you to step up and to make a profession of faith. And following your assent to all that the Catholic Church teaches, you were joined at the communion rail by those three newly baptized young people. And their father, laid hands on you and anointed you, indelibly sealing each one of you with the mark of confirmation, and called you by your new name. Special petitions for your sake were offered. And the table was set for the Eucharist. And when you went up and knelt at the communion rail again, you received for the first time our Lord 
and were profoundly changed. And we were and are now one. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Now, as you think about that, what I'd like you to share with us is what perhaps surprised you or startled you in all of this from the time we met <coughs> on Easter Vigil or even back in Triduum in any of the parts of the, the Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and certainly anything then from the Easter Vigil service. Anything that surprised you, startled you? <coughs> I got a uh, face full of holy water, just straight on. I think you saw me. <laughs> I saw him reposition, and then yeah. right there, Venture just a little you. extra. <laughs> okay. Did you have any questions? Things that you weren't sure of. powerful. I mean, it's transformed this whole thing, you know. For me, like, the, the confession in the morning was really impactful for me. I thought that like, I see, you know, not doing that all my life and doing that for the first time. Was, and that process of going through uh, you know, the, the clearing my con or whatever, the stuff and thinking about things I've done. And I just, for me, that was very impactful and I think healthy. And, and, and I look forward to, to continue doing that going forward. Know, being a Catholic now, I thought that was. I understand why it's done now. Uh -huh. and, and I was able to, yeah, it was, yeah, healthy, I think. It was correct, I think that was, it was good. So. It is healing. It's healing, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Good. Yeah. I guess just piggybacking on to kind of what he had said, just kind of with the confession, I think uh, it kind of makes, uh, I don't know if it <coughs> makes sense or not, but it kind of makes your sin uh, weigh a little bit more, too, as far as, uh, you know, in the future. Like, you know, I uh, have to confess this, and you know, it makes forgiveness a little, a little more real, I guess. I, 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 there's a one would hope anyway that ha knowing that you're going to have to say it out loud and say this is what I did I I'm taking ownership of this that maybe knowing that you're going to have to do that in the might, might also be something that would say wait a minute I don't want to have to go tell father I just did this so maybe I won't do it you know maybe it will help then to help you make wise choices but it is forgiveness is sweet forgiveness is and you do get that in the words when Father exalts you. I like to try that face to face at some point in time instead of being in mean, like the, the booth was cool at all, but it was kind of hard of hearing, so it was hard for me to hear. And like, uh, I thought I was speaking. <laughs> I mean, it was just, you know, it was, and it's kind of low. So I, yeah. For me, I think it would be, it would be good to try it at some point, it's like in a face to face situation, too. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, people are, different people are comfortable with one or the other. I know my husband is also hard of hearing. Yeah. And so sometimes Father was talking about the white noise that he's got, which kind of helps you, pre prevent you from somebody else overhearing you. But if you're hard of hearing, that may then contribute a little bit to that. So you might be more comfortable with the face-to-face. -face. I didn't know that was on purpose, that the white, because I mean, that was all from like when, I guess, I don't, yeah. And I thought that was just like a fan because they were hot. <laughs> and, I, and I always thought, like, God, those are the loudest fans. They do. And like the one that you open, like the, the one that with the door, yeah. it turns off when the door opens. And I was like, wow, that's just weird. <laughs> yeah. Well, I remember when we didn't, when the fans weren't there, you know, and yeah, you here. would sometimes 
you didn't want to hear it, but sometimes you would overhear somebody a little bit, you know, if you were uh, a little bit too close and stuff. So um, I, you know, I think it is a good idea. But I too thought initially that it was just we had a father who just couldn't stand the heat <laughs> so, yeah. and just got the fan for comfort, you know, rather than for having this other person. I think, I think that'll be something that takes a while to kind of get in the rhythm of, or I don't, I don't know. I talked to a couple other Catholics and said they never, they've never felt they, they do it, but they never feel like they're doing it right, or like they, so I think it'll take a while just to, you know, feel like I'm, like I don't know, the rhythm or do it right or something like that. And yeah. you can always, you know, like the first time you start off, you say, "Father, this is my first confession." Yeah. Now, of course, Father knew, yeah. given the circumstances, yeah. that that was likely yeah. for for somebody who was coming in right then on that morning. <clears throat> but you can, in the next times that you go in, you can tell a father, you know, whether it's here or any other Catholic church. I mean, you can go to confession in other places, too. You're not restricted only to go here. Uh, but you can tell father, you know, I'm a new Catholic. You know, I haven't done this very often. And father is going to be, you know, go out of his way to help you out. So that's a, that would be a good thing that you can you can do to kind of help you get into that rhythm of it. I know some people who mark it on their calendar, like it's the first Saturday. That means it's time to go to confession, or you know, they they choose a time that works for them. That that's one way to help them get that uh, rhythm set up. But you don't have to wait either. If you need to go sooner, then you can go sooner. But yeah, I was joking. I was after I did that, we went out to have the late lunch. And I was like, I probably need to get Father before we do the communion later tonight. I've already sinned again. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I ate too much. It's a feast. Yeah, it was. You're all right. I didn't eat my baked potatoes. Yeah. There you go, you're good. Other things that you will remember or hold in your heart from Easter vigil. Did it feel different yeah. to you? Sometimes people are surprised because it doesn't taste any different, right. you know. But remember, the accidents are the same, and yet there is a difference. Clearly, there is a difference. Yeah. Not, not in the taste, but in your heart. Last week too, I went to each one of them. I went to Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad I was able to do that throughout the, the week leading up to Saturday. So I thought, you know, I wanted to experience the whole thing, yes. you know, throughout the week. You know, starting on Palm Sunday and mm -hmm. going through the week, try to do as much as I could, you know, to experience it. Good. That isn't hasn't always been possible for me to be able to go to all of those for a variety of reasons, but. It makes such a difference to be able to participate fully and to really feel like you have prepared. And, you know, Father talked about the intentionality, you know. It, he talked to us about that at the beginning of Lent. He sent emails to everybody in the parish about, you know, being deliberate about what you were choosing, choosing how you were going to participate. And he did the same with the truth one, you know, that this is, there is, there is choice here. You, you can start with this, but, you know, you want to be very intentional about what you are doing. What are you opening yourself up for? You know, and pray to God for guidance in how can I get the most out of it. But being able to carve out that time and offer that is is a great is a great gift. Just to and jump in about confession. Something that's changed at our parish that's wonderful. And speaking of intentionality, on your way to mass, you can go to the back and go to confession. And that's a wonderful um, change from when you had to wait to Saturday or make it at 7.30 every morning if you could when confession was offered more routinely. But that's a very nice, um, it's very nice because if you want to go more often, you can. It's just very readily available. I know my husband and I took a little trade off and I'll, um, 
I'll sometimes go in the back and he'll have a seat for us towards, you know, where we usually sit. And I'll go back there and I, I'm just so grateful for that um, sacrament that the priests make time to offer to us as a congregation. And so on my way to Mass, if I know I'm going, I'll examine my conscience. And that's an example, I guess, of one way of being intentional. I know I'm going to go and it's time to go prepare myself. There's also one other thing that I don't think was brought up this year when we went over um, the sacrament of confession is you can do a daily examine of your conscience at the end of the day. Where have I pleased God? It doesn't have to be abusive to yourself or like suddenly I've got to pick out everything I've done wrong today. But you can ask, how did I please God? How did, how did I what, what happy things happened in my life today? And then it's funny how sometimes those other things will sort of work their way in and, and it could be some kind of a foundation for perhaps, you know, a confession at some point. But the examination of conscience can help you correct something to make the next day better. And I learned that from um, a Rainu Christie group that's here in our parish of lay women and we uh, went to a silent retreat and we had these little sheets of paper that would help us examine our conscience on a daily basis. And I thought, wow, what a good idea. It's really great. Yeah, thank you. I hope that whatever stays in your heart and you carry with you, you understand it's more than a feeling because you have been changed. And whether you feel it or not, We welcome you. We are glad to have been able to walk with you. We're not done walking with you yet. We've got a few more classes here that we're going to go. But we've, we've been so appreciative of the time and dedication that you have put into this and that we have been privileged to share in your journey with you. I've talked a little bit more than the 15 minutes, Becky, but we're going to have uh, our class tonight is on stewardship. And so Becky is going to talk with you. And Becky, I might right now your last name just leaves right. me. I'll introduce myself. Excellent. Liar. Okay. Okay. Thanks. I am Becky Meyer. I am the stewardship printer here at Blessed Sacrament. Um, stewardship is no longer going to be a foreign term to you and just something that everybody else knows. I'll try to keep it simple. Uh, caveat: I'm not a teacher. Um, <laughs> I like to talk to people, but I don't um, do screens and notes um, superbly. So you'll have to deal with the shoddy teacher, but I like, I love the conversation. So um, I have four kiddos here um, and married. There's two kids here and two kids at Cape and I guess. We've been in the parish about 12 years um, and I am a cradle Catholic. I grew up in Kansas City, went to um, a Catholic high school as well as grade school and then um, met my husband in college and we've been here ever since. So um, I've been in the office about four years. Um, Sonia's husband works with me also as stewardship coordinator and then there's another one of us. So there's three in the office, Erica, Zarita. Um, and our job is really to help you um, understand this new family that you're involved in and um, come into that life of living your faith um, here at the parish level. Um, so stewardship um, has a definition. I'm going to start with a prayer. I know we prayed once, but we're going to have a stewardship prayer um, because it is a good foundation. So, um, I didn't put my mask on. I should. Don't tell my boss. because it's framed from, um, I'm sorry, there's only one left, um, Bishop Kimmy. So uh, you can say with me or not, whatever you're comfortable with. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Help us, Lord, so that we would hold nothing back, that no sacrifice would be too great, too costly, or too unthinkable. Send us, Lord, heroes and heroines of stewardship. 
saints on the journey, whose walk as disciples inspire us to continue and pattern our own lives after. Put on our path, Lord, men and women and children, who will model for us, for our diocese, how to live, how to serve, how to love the Lord with all our hearts. Let this be our prayer. Let this be our greatest desire and intention. Amen. So this little uh, prayer and concept of stewardship is not uh, is not something that just the Diocese of Wichita does, not just Blessed Sacrament. It's a biblical concept, and I'm going to start, and again, walking around. I don't like passing things out all at the same time. I have, I have lots of gifts for you, though. Um, this is a definition of stewardship, and we're going to go through because it's biblically based. But it's hard to see it if you just, I just say it. I'm a, I'm a visual learner. I don't know about you guys. but um, So here is the quotes of where, the definition, and then we're going to go through the, where it is. Um, this allows you to, to have, uh, if, you, if this is a concept that you want to study more, you will have, be able to go search up these exact um, Passages. So, this definition is made up by the Diocese of Wichita, but um, the, you'll find the concepts below. So, the stewardship is a grateful response of a Christian disciple who recognizes and receives God's gifts and shares these gifts in love of God and neighbor. So, then if you go back to the very beginning in the garden, um, it is, you know, we were, I don't, the passage is um, when he's creating the earth and he's giving us all of these things. He's creating the water and the, um, and it says that we will have dominion over all of our animals and plants. So we're, he's giving us all of these great things, but we're in control of those. So there's he has gifts. The uh, catechism says, in the beginning, God entrusted the earth and its resources to the common stewardship of mankind to take care of them, master them by labor, and enjoy their fruits. The goods of creation are destined for the whole human race. So stewardship, this is where the teacher comes in, it's heavy. Stewardship presupposes the universal destination of goods, which then obliges us to put our possessions at the service of our neighbor. So God gave us a lot of things, everything, including our very being, right? And then, so stewardship is then being grateful for those gifts that we've been given, acknowledging that they came, who they came from, and then expressing those in the way. Um, and so it's broken down by uh, word by word. So grateful can be found in Psalm uh, 116. It says, how can I repay the Lord for all his goodness to me? So just have a grateful heart. Um, then we're called to respond. They brought a great amount of tithe of everything. So recognizing that and being grateful. Um, been baptized, then a disciple is called. So a Christian is the baptized, a disciple is those who are um, fulfilling their baptismal call. Recognizing them, again, recognizing and response, they run together, that everything comes from God and we have given um, you know, we've been given all of those things. Receiving them, having gifts. You know, there's lots of different things. We don't all have the same gifts. They're very specific. Just like you were chosen, your gifts were chosen also for you very specifically. And then in Timothy it says, Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. So then we're called to go out and not keep them for ourselves. Some of our gifts um, are for us to succeed and to use in life but a lot of them is a response back that we're to be given away those gifts. And then that's the in love of God and neighbor. Each should use their gifts to serve others. So if you want to dig into that definition, um, there it is a little bit further. But what I appreciate is um, the next part. And that's just me telling you a little bit more about how to live this stewardship way of life. It's not a checkbox that I can say this looks like you will go be involved in Altar Society and you in Men's Club and you're going to help with Oktoberfest and you're going to give me a lot of money, Christian. Okay. I'm sorry. 
So, um, so it's a way of life that we are just generally called every day to respond to the grateful gifts that we've been given. And so, um, it's not a it's not a program that we're enrolling you in. It's not a it's a it's a concept that we continually are called to recognize that we've been given gifts. So, there's four pillars of stewardship in the commons. Um, we're not there a whole lot this year. It's the main space in front of the gym. There's these four words. They're the pillars of stewardship, hospitality, formation, prayer, and service. And so those are then the practical actions necessary to live a stewardship way of life. And so you'll hear a lot about them. Sometimes our bulletins are structured in ways to do that. So it's really simply prayer is what it sounds like. You know, that's the peak and pinnacle of everything. We're asking you to live your baptism call and have a relationship with Jesus Christ, therefore get to heaven. So prayer is the foundational one. Um, hospitality, you know, you can't be expected to share your gifts if you're not comfortable where you are, if you're not welcome. So um, we really try hard to, and you probably have gifts of hospitality within you, you know, just basic opening doors and saying hello to people and greeting those new ones. I think you hopefully experienced some of those as you uh, this weekend as people who didn't know you at all were like congratulations thank you I was good to see you or something like that hopefully you had some of those things um, so again recognizing that you're a gift to us as um, and then we have those expressions to give back uh, service is you know we're called to be like Jesus and of service to others and then formation this class doesn't make you done and oh you should know it all we're continuing at I cradle Catholic still don't know anything more you know necessarily don't have it all figured out that's what I mean so that formation is a is a chronic call it's not just a one-time thing so uh, the then you'll hear these expressions or fruits of the stewardship way of life so if you live in response and understand that those grateful gifts are giving back then <clears throat> those expressions or fruits of that stewardship way of life are expressed through um, time, talent, and treasure. And we're all called at different phases of our lives to give in different ways of our time. And they're not it's not time, talent, or treasure. It's not, it, they're all together. They're all equal. There's three legs of a stool and it can't exist without all three of them. So the time for me in my life currently is that the way I spend my time, we say in time in church. So we're, time to give back to God. So you're expected to go to Mass. That is living a stewardship way of life when you go to Mass. Um, when you would participate in a book study or things like that, those are things you're spending your time with. They also, um, then we have talents that we can give. So if you are a writer and would like to write, um, I my job is to help you figure out how to use those talents, writing um, an article for something um, within the church or it doesn't have to be within this parish, but we help you facilitate as stewardship coordinators in this journey of living a stewardship way of life. Figure out what talents you do have and then how to be of service to another, whether it's in the parish or the community or your family. So we're all called in different ways to do that. And then uh, part of giving back, not only of our time and our talents, but is also um, of a monetary uh, gift. And so the tithe is a biblical concept as well. We're called to give back of our first fruits, so first fruits of our labor. Um, and it is nothing I'm gonna sit down and tell you, this is this is how much, I hope no one ever does that. Um, definitely won't come from our office for sure, but you, you, between you and God, what, what grateful response do you have to give back of your time, talent, and treasure um, to go ahead and live that stewardship way of life? Because you recognize that you're a steward of the gifts you've been given. So, um, quick explanation. So what we do is invite you to register as parishioners. I know you filled out a lot of paperwork to be baptized and confirmed and all of those things. Uh, believe it or not, that's not registering as a member of Blessed Sacrament. That was just to get you through a process of um, the right of Christian initiation. So if you want to be a member of Blessed Sacrament, you have the next steps are to um, call the parish office. I have a bulletin with all that stuff on information on it. I have a cool little magnet. No, it's kind of old school, but I'm a big fan because it has Blessed Sacraments 
picture on it. I'll give you that. Um, you can go online. There's an I'm new tab and it has a registration page. And what that gets you is, a, is an introduction to somebody in my office. We would love, weird, have you guys been everywhere? I guess you might have, not through the school maybe. We'll give you a tour of your new parish home when you're a registered member. So you join the Catholic Church, you didn't join a specific parish. So that's what this registration would do if you want to do that. Um, and then we'll figure out very specifically to you how you'd like to exhibit that stewardship way of life. And so what do you want to be involved in? Um, we have 72 ministries that will help you um, encompass some of those things. There's, there's things you can do without being involved in a ministry. So that's our job is to kind of find your place in this new parish family and help you live and understand the gifts you've been given and then how to give them back to other people. So um, I could talk for hours on it, but my favorite is just kind of giving you a little synopsis of the seasons of my life so you can kind of understand. Stewardship has changed for me. When we first had little kids, um, I could do absolutely nothing. I could barely open a door. I was bringing so many kids to church. They're all two years apart. So I had a four-year-old, two-year-old, and a baby, and I could b literally barely open a door to get into the church or the school to do lunch. But I could add orange juice, milk, or bacon to my grocery list and drop it by for someone else to give to St. Anthony Family Shelter. And at the time, I could go to mass giving my time my talent wasn't much because I couldn't get out of my home, but I guess the talent was, you know, filling out the sheet and getting the extra groceries. And then um, my husband and I always made a commitment to just give what we could to the church. When we had a lot of small kids, that was a little bit different than when we were in entry level jobs. That tithe was a lot different than it is now that we've had, you know, stable jobs for 20 years. So, um, then, you know, when we had kids in school, I was in, in the classroom a lot. I was PTO chair and helping in different ways. Um, then the next phase, you know, I could only do a parish book study. I couldn't go out. There's a phase of life I could serve at downtown on Sundays and um, serve the homeless with St. Vincent's Paul. So lots of different seasons of life. Now it's a little bit different since I talk to everybody else about it all the time. Um, I now am paid to talk about stewardship so I, there's a fine line um, because I talk about it I'm really intentional about doing it then so we participate in book studies and walking with purpose and make sure that we still get to mass and we still give but our talents have changed so um, you'll have seasons and we'll help you figure out how to use your Sorry. talents um, in, the, in the different seasons of your life so uh, questions? third time I've given the talk, never had a question yet. That does not mean I'm good at it. That means you guys are really excited. Um, it is, you're, you're really good at it. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, I have a couple things. If, if you, you, so you said if you sign up in the office, you get a magnet? Oh, uh, no. Right now, I'll give you a magnet. Right now. Oh, so if you sign up online, do you get a magnet? Like no. A no. Only tonight. Oh, well, like, you don't oh, have to uh, sign up. I'll just give it to you. Um, so the diocese of Wichita is very, very special. This, again, this concept of stewardship is biblical, but we don't practice it around the world like we do here in this particular diocese. So 35 years ago, um, Monsignor Magreed was a pastor at St. Francis, and he thought that it would be great if we could provide our Catholic school kids with an education that was tuition free because we were grateful for all that we'd been given and we were hoping that uh, we could pass those that gratitude on to everyone and provide um, this concept of stewardship only. So not a tuition based school but a tithe based school system. So he challenged all of the parishes. He got together, he experimented at St. Francis for a couple of years and then um, challenged, got a bunch of priests on board and the bishop and got, it was amazing. And they all said, well, we're gonna take this big giant leap of faith that everyone can understand this concept of giving back. And of that giving back, then we can support 
staff members and we can support schools and we can take care of one another, basically. So if we all live this stewardship way of life, it is in essence taking care of your neighbor. That's the very, you know, that's the very definition of stewardship and living that way. So the diocese took a leap. We're the only diocese in the entire world that is able to provide the concept. This is a history of that diocese that you um, have joined. Um, you're welcome. I'm all about gifts. So um, it is not written by anybody here, Christian. I have one. Um, grateful and giving is then you know we talked about those things: giving back and then being um, grateful. So that's your history of um, this diocese. You can read it. Um, it's pretty simple, but uh, you're not required. I'm just, I like to give gifts, so there you go. Pretty pretty picture of the Holy Spirit. Um, again, you probably picked these up, but um, I like to go through the bulletin with you because it's online, but I know you probably don't need this either. But, um, but so you know how to get a hold of us if you'd like to register, how you'd... This is under bulletin online. I don't, you guys probably don't need both. Uh, so, all of your mass times and important confession times, down here is the parish office, so it's easy to get to. Uh, this is all online. Then the, the cool thing about like the extra stuff that we do, here's more contact information on the back. So, uh, always a good resource is to this is the life and happening. This is, if you want to know how to live the stewardship way of life, it's probably on a weekly basis posted in this. It is online as well. Um, fuck, I did bring you guys lots of gifts. Here's your magnet. Um, it really is old school. It has our monstrance on it, which I appreciate and love. Um, so that's our website. It is the longest website on the planet, especially um, when you type it in a couple times a day. And um, then, see one more thing. If you don't ever want to forget the definition of stewardship, there it is. Um, I use it as bookmark. And then, to start off your prayer life, I'm sure you got lots of resources. Maybe you got gifts. I'm hoping that somebody gave you gifts as part of your um, coming into the church, but. Um, if you don't want them, don't take them, but I'm going to set them up here. They're um, the Catholic devotional. So, you know, if you didn't grow up with prayers, memorizing them, and your teachers testing you like I did, <laughs> um, there's a good little book that um, you can use. Prayers for the sick, prayers for the dying. Um, I think there might be an examination of conscience um, in the little book. So they'll just be up here for you. So just to get you started if you want. Uh, we welcome you to Blessed Sacrament if you'd like. You're welcome to be here as well. If you don't want to register, keep coming to Mass here. It's fine. But um, that's my job is to just help you get connected and use your gifts. So thanks for having me. I told him it would be short, so I hope that's good. Um, I want to add that um, Easter, we gave away a book. If you did not get it on your way out of church, yes. um, it is available still at the entrances. They also are going to have a book study that I think Samantha will put a online sign up, but there'll also probably be things at the back of church this week yep. to sign up. Yep. Um, it's it's small groups. I, my husband and I are offering one Monday nights. Um, it's a great way to get to know other people, but it's also just a great way to share ideas about this book that everyone in the parish should or could be reading. Um, so I invite you to that. It's called The Search by Chris Stefanik. And yeah. if you've never, if, it, it's amazing. He, yeah. He's a very dynamic writer and speaker. Um, and you won't, it's... It's an easy read. It, right. It's not a super deep theological book. It's pretty light, but pretty deep in um, topic. Yeah. But it's beautiful. Yeah. Um, another, she was talking about Ultra Society and Men's Club. Um, those are two of the really easy uh, things to get involved in um, a because they have regular meeting times women's altar society meets 
uh, first Tuesday, second Tuesday of every month from seven o'clock to whenever. And for those of you that are going, yeah, my mom went and they argued about the price of a vacuum cleaner for months because that's what was when I joined. It is not that way at Blessed Sacrament. We focus mostly on the fellowship of women. We have adult and not and, and non adult beverages and usually a light meal. Men's Club meets the third Thursday of every month, and that is another way to get to know men in the diocese or in the parish. Um, they start also at seven, I think, um, and they usually have a, a full meal. And uh, it's There's stations before. And well. stations before. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So look for that in the bulletin. I'll try to, I know last couple of weeks, you guys I've sent, for the men, I've sent uh, an email that Jesse had forwarded to me. I'll continue to do that for a few months, but it is a great way to get to know. It's They kind of call it the gateway to stewardship really because it's, it's a really easy group to join. And I'm usually there every month. My daughter's Altar Society president this year, so I'm supporting her especially. And when you I kind of looked at the schedule today, knowing we were going to you know, yes. go to the ministries and stuff. Yes. And, and I know like, you guys have the class on Tuesday night, the Walking with Purpose. Walking with Purpose yeah, um, for women, Cape is Men for yeah. um, Men. Christ Life will come back, I think, in the fall, which is a nice, another little transition for anybody, new Catholic or not. It is your journey with Jesus. Uh, so really basic, but really profound, uh, because it's a similar maybe a little bit similar to this we add a meal <laughs> and then we add uh, a little bit of content and then a discussion so you're you're kind of journeying with Jesus um, in a group and then um, the other one is a parish book program you know that'd be a nice easy um, one there's one other I was does, thinking of does the priest ever come to those I mean that's one of the things I have to school about this is having the priest ever now and again to, yeah to, yeah. Because they seem so busy. Like it's, I mean, like he it's, stops by Men's Club and Altar Society almost every time. Yeah. So you get to kind of... The other thing is, you're, his door, although he seems busy, is that's what he's here for. So he is that he is that patriarch. He is that father of... He is that shepherd of everyone in his parish. So his door is not literally always open, but he is always welcoming you to make an appointment with if you have things that are like, gosh, this is just kind of sticking with me, and I'd, I'd love to discuss it with him in particular, he's got a relationship with you now that, you know, you've been through this process. Come into the parish office and put it on Melinda's calendar. You don't have to tell her what it's about. You can just say, I need an appointment with Father. Um, you might be waiting a week or two. Um, he's going to be gone for a month this June, so don't make it June when you have a need. I'm just kidding. Go Father Matt's here, though. <laughs> They'll have a broken liquor, so. But, yeah. So he got he does stop by our ministries a lot. Um, opens with prayer, starts. Uh, have you guys done much of Lectio Divina? So we have done, done some yes. form yes. of scripture study. He likes to lead those. Yeah. Um, so he used to have a noon scripture study, a seven a.m. scripture study, and so you could dig into the Bible with him. But I, life is lived through the scriptures a lot of times, so. It's interesting how I didn't go to talk to the priest about a specific thing in my life, but the scripture brings it out when you meditate on it, and then he answers my question without me knowing that I had a question directly to him. So um, scripture study is another way to... This schedule changes, and COVID affects it a lot. So we're on our way back to making ministries more active. So the bulletin and the pastor's email will be here. There's another Bible, and it's called Men's Formation. Um, it's basically Bible and beer. <laughs> not much different than Men's Club, but not as large. <laughs> Knights of Columbus have a little bit different mission, so yeah. Make an appointment, register in the parish, we'll um, get in contact with you if you want. What else? Those were good. Holy Hour. 
Uh, oh. Just stop by the Adoration Chapel. You don't have to have a. So the set holy do you guys know the code to the Adoration Chapel? 1962. It's not a secret. Um, it's the first year of the Second Vatican Council. So, uh, and it is open. I am hopeful that it is open to more than four people in the near future. So, uh, right now there's a four-person limit with COVID, so you're not in people's spaces. But I think as we continue to open up, it will continue to get better. So you don't have to have a scheduled hour to stop by, but the <coughs> peak, the four, the number of four is for those people with the assigned hour first. So um, I've been in there a lot of times recently where the people that are close to done, they get up so I can have that fourth spot, which I appreciate. So I hope someone does for you. Yeah, or you can yeah, come on Sunday it. night from 11 to midnight. I'm there by myself, <laughs> okay? Yeah. So you're welcome to do that. Now, right now, because of COVID, Jesus is not always exposed. Sometimes he's in the tabernacle. But you can still go to the chapel and pray anyway. <clears throat> and if you need to get into the church, there's another code. Yeah, if, if you're you coming come after between midnight. 11. Yeah. PM and 5 AM, let me know and I'll get you the other outfit. I don't know how many urgent needs there are, but I know that on Wednesday from 9 AM to 10 AM, there's a need, just throwing that out there on the table. Yeah, so and what they're talking about, I don't know how much you've talked about adoration, but um, as part of you know people's commitment to prayer or formation or just spending time with God, the Adoration Chapel is always open um, pre-COVID 24-7 uh, to pray with uh, the Blessed Sacrament. So she's talking about it being exposed or not exposed, meaning um, you know the tabernacle is open and you can see or a monstrance is out. So the open hours and the closed hours means that there's a, we don't want to ever leave Jesus alone in the, in the, in the day when he's exposed. And so for 30 Two years the Adoration Chapel's been here? Longer than that. Almost. 37th? Uh, November of 1983. Yeah. I was going to say, I, I had a, a newborn, so and he came along with me. So, it is the <laughs> He's 38. Year Blessed Sacrament. It was the first one in the diocese to go 24-7. <clears> so, before COVID, it was open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, for more than 30 years. And so, it's an amazing concept, but... Um, it's just a nice place of peace and quiet. So as part of your giving back, you could spend that time in prayer, an hour. That open need then would be a commitment that you would be making to on a weekly basis to attend that adoration hour over and over again every week. Um, the fruits of that are, I, I, it's unbelievable. If you just give that hour to God once a week, it's, it's amazing. You yeah. don't have to make that commitment to attend, though. If you, yeah, I was going to say that. If you just start... Just I've always been amazed by it, but if you just start like going there when you have 10, 15 minutes and just sitting there and like being quiet, and in today's world, it's pretty amazing. Just I mean, trying to put your phone away, it's kind of tempting to get it out and start messing with it. But it's 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 a pretty spiritual. Th I mean, obviously it's a very spiritual thing, but yeah. it's it's good for your it's good for your head too. Yeah. And I did we, we do. I mean, you don't have to have an hour, five yeah. minutes. I would go until my baby started screaming. <laughs> it happens. Yeah, you can just drop by, and sometimes that's a, a good thing to do if you've had a stressful day at work or if you've got something coming up and you just need, you really need some help on making a decision. That's a great place to go to just center yourself. And uh, you don't have to do a whole hour to begin with, otherwise, like when I do mine right now, I have to wait for somebody to come because Jesus goes back in the tabernacle at midnight. And so I wait for Father to come. And so I get to see Father every Sunday evening, unless he forgets and then I call him. And I say, Father. <laughs> okay. Uh, one last thing to next week, Father Matt will be joining us. Um, and it is stump the priest or ask him a question. So if you would like to remain anonymous, please email me a question. I mean, it can be anything. Can I come? 
Yeah, you may. Uh, it could be anything, and I mean, all bets are off. You know, I mean, just just ask him anything. So, you know, why why do why on Saturday night was he's back to us most of the time instead of him being on the other side of the altar? That's a question that's asked a lot. Um, whatever comes to your mind, you know, why why is it okay to receive it on my hand or my tongue, which is better, standing up, kneeling, think, whatever you go. I'm still just not quite sure of this. Um, think about it. You can bring the question if you're, you know, if you don't mind just asking it, or you can send it to me, and we'll do, we'll just read them anonymously. So, I will when I send the email next week. I will ask you to think about that. But just for now, just be thinking. Okay. So. Um, thank you very much sure. for sure. sharing all of this. Talking about gifts, you did get a bookmark. Uh, with a quote from St. Augustine. Um, so I hope that that might provide you with something that speaks to your soul. And I think tonight, to close for a prayer, we ought to say that glory be, don't you think? I mean, that seems like the, a great prayer right here at the end of this evening and as we are finishing up Easter. We're not quite done yet, but in terms of this class. So, in the name of the Father, the Son, <coughs> Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen.